Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the CTMP60 podcast. Remember to please like, comment, and share this show if you've been enjoying so far. We are so pleased with the feedback we've received as we share these amazing stories about the past 60 years of racing memories at Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. Listen, our guest today is, to quote Alan De La Plante's episode, someone we all know and love, uh, Mr. Paul Cook. Paul Cook is an important figure in Canadian motorsport history. He has been a driver, a mechanic, a team manager with the legendary Comstock racing outfit, as well as race director for Formula One Canadian Grand Prix events, and eventually became vice president of the previous National Sporting Authority for Canada, known as ASN Canada FIA. Uh, there, Paul played an integral role as director of karting in the development of Canada's young racing drivers. Paul has millions of stories about racing, but we focus mostly on his racing, the Comstock era, and those glory days of motorsports at the legendary circuit known then as Mosport Park. So please enjoy, and without further ado, Mr. Paul Cook. Yeah, we, we are too. Well, so but, <laughs> yeah, I've watched all the podcasts, and, 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 I'll, and I'll see it oh. again. I think Sam does, Sam does a great job. Thank you, and he Thank really you. does. Thanks, and, and Sam. You know, you, you know, I, I think you have a lot of the qualities of your father, and and, and and I think you make an excellent coach, no matter what you do, because you instill confidence when you talk, and and that's one of the attributes your dad has. It is really, that's really good. good, really good. It makes good people feel comfortable, but and you have this, you have that as well. Yeah, it's good to know but, I'm not adopted. I guess. <laughs> I uh, I feel honored to be included in the uh, uh, 60th anniversary geriatric heritage series. <laughs> okay, this is the the greatest living Mosport personality still with a memory. <laughs> <laughs> But but interestingly enough, um, most part to me, and I've made some notes here. That's why you see me looking down a little bit. But that's all right. Um, most part to me is is all about what was and is today. It's, it's a village, and so it, it, it's a very vibrant village. It, it it has a hierarchy. It has a structure. It has a place to go and. Throughout my life and throughout my career, I've always felt more comfortable going to most sport than going to almost any other racetrack. And um, it, it, it's because there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I have to give a huge, huge hats off to Miles Brandt and his track team. And, um, you know, the marshals out there, it's sun, wind, rain, and even snow. The teams, the mechanics, drivers, organizing clubs, their members, the after race cleanup people, and all the sponsors and their products. Uh, that, 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 that's what Mosport was all about, and that's what Mosport is all about. And with Miles, I worked. Uh, I learned a lot from him, and I think hopefully maybe he learned a little bit from me. But we spent a lot of time trundling around gravel traps, uh, tire barriers, uh, mm -hmm. capture fences that, could, that that did the opposite of what they were supposed to do, uh, track repairs, <laughs> medical intervention, ambulances, helicopters, whatever going on, and 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 miles. Like, like, like you, Ron, always calm, always cool, always collected. And uh, if you really, 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 really needed something, Miles could tell you how to get along without it and, and, and still be effective. So uh, when, when you're in the business of running a racetrack, you have a lot of people who want to tell you how to do it. But um, as you as as you know, but yeah. um, you know all the way back to the the old bell hand crank telephone systems at each corner that Harvey called it his communications network, which 
<laughs> might as well have been two. <laughs> Might as well be in two tomato cans and a string, but um, <laughs> then and 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 then who will ever forget Harold Knapp and his wife? But there's just far too many people that, that you can't name, but not forgotten. Certainly not in my mind. And frankly, being around for sixty years is quite a long time. But anyhow, yes. So. Um, one of the things, one of the things that's terribly important to me is setting the record straight about the first event ever held at Mosworth. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. And we will segue directly there, yes. Make, make and your case. What, what, when, you have when proof. It, when it became the most famous dirt track in Canada. Now... The spring of 61, the British Columbia International Trade Fair across Canada rally, which was sanctioned by the FIA, wow. had, had listed and each that ran from Montreal to Vancouver, and each day had a special stage. Huh. Day one was most work. Now, uh, still a roughly graded gravel road it was at the time but the special stage started off at essentially the start finish went down through turns one turn two turn three and abruptly made a right turn off the track uh, up the hill down into the gravel bed, out of the gravel bed, and into the infield. And that was the end of the section. Um, <laughs> oh. I can tell you that that was exciting, to say the least. Now, Ford of England had entered a team of Ford Zephyrs. And they had their three top-level drivers with Canadian co-drivers, of which I was one. So... Having been a shareholder in Mosport at the time, <laughs> having been the team leader for the Ford factory team of Zephyrs, and having been a competitor, I have a really good memory of that event. Mm -hmm. And justification of having that listed as the first event at, at Mosport is the right thing to do. Do you guys agree with me? Yeah, I don't. I don't see why not. <laughs> it, why, right. yeah. Yeah. Now it's, it was a it was an FIA FIA listed event. Abs yes, and and you know what? I'd have to go back, but <laughs> it may be well one of the first FIA sanctioned events in Canada. I'd have to oh, go back. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And and see see wow. at the at the time at the time can Canada racing was fell under the RAC in England. So it went from CASC in Canada to the RAC in England to the FIA, and that was that, that and, and, and there was a chap by the name of Dean Delamont at the time that, that was in England and he, he he looked after Canada, the colonials, okay. So, so anyway. the current the current story <laughs> is that the first race at what was most port is June of 1961, correct? Yeah. And so this rally would have taken place you in one month? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. If this rally took place before the track was even paved. Oh, okay, okay. The track That's was not crazy. paved. Yeah. Okay, That's so crazy. this was what what year and date was this then? Yeah, I, I gave all that information to your father. Oh, okay, you don't want to tell me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll I'll send it I, all to you. I, I, okay, I'll, I'll, it was in I forwarded it to you, Samuel. Oh yeah, yeah. It was I in May of '61. Okay. Okay, May '61. Okay. okay. Now, May just to so get the place paved in a month. Well, see, here's wow. where here's where here's where the history's a little bit. <laughs> Like, like, I know what I'm talking about when it comes to what the first event was, but then when I see some of the other things, I'm saying, well, I'll just, I'm going to zip it because 
I, I know, I know my, I got my data correct. Okay. But perhaps, uh, anyway, it's worthwhile researching a little bit. And, okay. Uh, well, there was, there was definitely a players 200 in 1961. It may have been, I don't I think, think it was I, don't, I, doubt, I, doubt I think it was, it was late June. June. I think it was like the yeah. 24th or something. It was not it. Okay. Well, it, 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 when, 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 when they, the, the man putting together the track at most for it was no fool. And he, he was, he ran the, I would, the highways department for the province of Ontario. He was wow. a really, really good man. Yeah. Good man. And, um, um, anyway, Sam, it's worthwhile looking into that a little bit. I don't mind helping. Sure. You sure. Um, um, now, now, now I just want to, a footnote to that, to that, uh, BCITF rally. Um, when I left, when we left, my driver and I left most work to carry on in the rally. Um, we were on the leaderboard. Uh, we were in the top three, five until after we left Regina. And we had spent too much time in Regina doing interviews with CBC. A, because we're a leading car, because we're Ford, because we've got leading drivers. And you know what the press is like, Ron, they like that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so anyway, we, we were late leaving Regina. So a little while later, we, we, we were heading, we're, we're going to go to Edmonton that day, but we got to, uh, we got to going up a highway paved. I'm calling out a 90 degree left turn to my driver, which is what you're, you know, it's my job to do that. So I'm counting him down to the, to the turn and we get to the turn and he is full off going into the turn. All of a sudden we hit gravel because the intersecting road coming down came off a gravel road onto the paved road, carried all the gravel onto it. So down we go into the ditch uh, after the turn and we <laughs> must have rolled five, six, seven times. Okay. Oh man. And, um, <laughs> you know, over we went full tilt and I can remember to this day and Ron, you know what it's like when this, sorry, when this stuff is going on around you, it's, it's all kind of, you know, it's kind of, you don't know where the hell you're at. Okay. And, uh, uh, finally it stopped. Okay. And so I realized that I was okay, but my driver was not quite as much because he had concussion. Okay. Anyway, other cars stopped and we uprighted the car, but the windshield was broken. I happened to notice that the shape of the rear window was the same shape as the front window. So I got the rear window out and I put it in where the front window is supposed to go and taped it up. But off we trundled to, 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 to Edmonton, whereupon we were excluded, went to the hospital. <laughs> and in the middle of the night, checked out of the hospital and we had a car and carried on in the rally catching up with the other cars. And I don't know if you've ever heard of the Cascade section of the Rockies run. It like, it's kind of. Oh, we lost Ron. The road to hell, right? We lost Ron. We lost Ron. Yeah. He'll join back up for us. Okay. I don't know why. He's having internet problems. Okay. Anyhow, um, we managed to pass a lot of the rally cars with an absolutely bog stock. Wow. Ford sedan, but. Uh, and, and, and most importantly, we never did catch the dog that ran in front of us at in Delmeny, Saskatchewan. Hmm. So um, the dog ran in front of us and we had to avoid it. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Policeman, that's the honest truth. So help me go. So, <laughs> so, so that's kind of uh, that's kind of what that's kind of what that was all about. What was that? What was that event like, though, when you got to uh, Mostport for the on the first day of the rally, where people like really excited because it was um, a new track that was kind of yet to be 
there were a lot of people at Mosport because there was a lot of publicity about the about the track. But uh, the, Sam, nobody knew there were no fences. Okay. Yeah. So there was a crowd control issue, and uh, it. But but we had to get that straightened out before any car ventured out onto the onto the section of the track we were using. But wow. Uh, but, but it was kind of. But people were really good. They very respectful, and they they they, they stayed away and put them up on top of the hill at two, so that they could see all the cars coming down from one, coming making the right turn up onto the top of two, and then down into the infield. It was really really exciting, I have to say. So um, okay. I have to I have to admit I my knowledge of rallies is not the most but do you get like a uh, do you get to see the special like before you you drive it or do you just go in blind oh, into turn one it's blind <laughs> it's blind um, you have you have what are called uh, army maps surveillance maps that, that were used and you have one okay. I had a whole I had a whole sachet filled with them for each section and uh, you'd get some briefing notes from the organizers roughly now back today in rally you get a you know you get a route map that's absolutely almost as if it's a movie in front of you but it's just in words and it it's really really good because the cars are very very fast but um in uh, in those days uh rallying was pretty like it was uh it was like uh, the last frontier. Yeah. Going out at west, yeah. and 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 the, and and the Trans Canada Highway at the time, a lot of it was still gravel, hmm. and so um, so it was pretty primitive, but just I mean, that was a lot of fun, just a lot of fun. But was fa- was Westwood involved in any of the specials mm-hmm. when you, when you got out to BC? Was Westwood part of one of the specials or? Uh, not that particular event. Okay. Uh, late, late, later on in one of the Shell 4000 events, um, um, uh, we ended up uh, finishing. Well, there's a couple of interesting stories there. We had Henry Taylor, who was the uh, uh, he, he was the boss of Ford Rowling in Europe. He came and did the rally, and uh, he did it in Anglia. And uh, we had we had Mustangs, so uh, the rally ended on Saturday night. So on Sunday we went out to Westwood and said we, we would race. We would race the winning Mustang. Oh, nice! But I, and I drove it. Okay. And we would race the winning Anglia. So here we took some scrap tires from one of the other competitors on steel rims. And we, we didn't do anything. We just put gasoline, check the oil, and all that sort of stuff. So I qualified second, <laughs> much to the chagrin of all the local people who had I'm all sure. of this. You can imagine they all of their their race prepared uh, cars, <laughs> and uh, and and they're just really really you know go 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 and Lori Craig and all those people Bob McLean and. and uh, and there are just all real racers and they got the tents and the uniforms and all of that. And along comes the race winning Mustang. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, on, on, on lap, it was a 12 lap race on lap seven, I challenged for the lead and uh, Bob McLean, who was in the lead, he, he nudged me off and, and, uh, and I didn't come back on again. And, um, Oops. But anyway, it was a, it was a real shocker because because the newspapers carried the story about this car having finished this five thousand mile rally yet was good enough to uh, to run for the lead at uh, Westwood. So yeah. it was that one heck of a story. So, yeah. So Ford loved it just absolutely I'm sure. loved it. Uh, we had an interesting one. Comstock Racing Team was out at the track quite often. Yeah. And uh, and we we were located. The contact racing team was located in Agincourt, or as we called it, Agincourt. Okay. 
Uh, and that was at 401 and Kennedy Road at the time. That was at the, 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 the Comstock manufacturing plant. CFTO TV was just down the street at McCowan Road. It's where it is today. So Saturday night, they had a motorsport show. Is that like and, the Bell? The Bell? Mm -hmm. Is that like the Bell um, headquarters now? Yeah, that yeah yeah, it's okay. still the same location. Okay. Okay. Anyway, they had a they had a sort of a Saturday night motorsport kind of a thing, and Anna Stukas, who was extremely well known football guy, um, and sometimes Johnny Esau, who was a big instrumental guy in in, in sports at CFTO. Um, uh, they would not have a guest. So they would call me and say, can you bring something over and spend half an hour talking with us? Um, the, uh, um, became a good relationship there. So I got to know a lot of the, uh, cameramen who then worked for Chetwin. Uh, yeah. Times. And, um, but they used to call Comstock the steamroller team of most sport. Okay. <laughs> just with all your money and your deep pockets, you just walk over all the little guys. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth with a right. helmet time staying in front of the little guys. Okay. Right. Anyhow, we're at, uh, we're, we're at, we're, we're out at most sport going to do some filming for promo for the players 200 fall event and we got to talking about which was faster around the track a car or a helicopter <laughs> so the car that i was mm -hmm. using was the was the uh, uh, was, was the king cobra so we, we we were sort of you know they as you know they mount cameras all over the thing and they're doing the promo and they're they're pretending I'm Sterling Moss, so I'm driving in there. They're making, trying to make me look like Sterling Moss, uh, which is hard to do at the best of times, particularly if they were using a stopwatch. But um, and anyhow, so we said, okay, let's uh, let's let, let's have a race. We'll start at the start finish line, and we'll come back to the start finish line, and we'll see whether a car is faster than a helicopter. So <laughs> <laughs> we took off from, 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 from the start finish and um, it was nip and tuck until we got down around turn four, but I could see the helicopter. I could, amazingly enough, you could also hear it because they were kind of a little bit low to be honest with you, but anyhow. Uh, <laughs> so I noticed when we turned to come up the back straight, I couldn't hear the helicopter as much. So we came around and stopped at the start finish. And of course I beat the helicopter. So when I talked to the pilot, he said, well, look, I had a little trouble with slippage at turn five. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he, said, he said, I had the wrong rails for the test. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's amazing what, um, what we could, uh, amazing what we could do in those days uh, and have fun and stuff right. you could never do today. But it gave, uh, it gave interest to all the people that were involved and, and, and the cameraman and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So, so those were, those were really sort of relaxed kinds of, kinds of, well, not relaxed, but you could do more things and, and, and befriend people and have some fun with them. Can I ask you, uh, one of the things that interests me is, is, um, well, for obviously for a lot of us, we don't, we've only lived life with, you know, CTMP Mosport being there and being at our, uh, use and disposal, whether as a fan or a driver or whatnot. But yeah. so you, you started racing in 1957, correct? Yes. So you kind of, I, I'm assuming you raced at places like Harewood and, some of the airport circuits and Indian such. Dale. And then what was that like? What was the scene like back then? And then going in 1961 to, 
um, Mostport, which became like kind of the the center of the of the scene. Um, what um, was that like? First of all, it matters not what decade we're talking about. A race driver is a race driver, and a racetrack is a racetrack. Sure. And the the uh, the emotion and passion that goes into it that I found didn't really change. Um, by and large, race drivers are pretty pretty talented people. Uh, when, when, when you know when you think about you know a couple of tons of metal going around a racetrack on a little tiny little tiny patch of rubber, four of them. Yeah. And what the drivers are able to do to control that is absolutely a remarkable. But so, so, so the point I'm making with you, it didn't matter whether you were talking Edenvale in 57, uh, Harewood, um, Greenacres, uh, whatever it was. I even, I even raced at uh, the CNE with my MGTC to put on a display, display of sports car racing at the stock car race. Cool. And as a matter of fact, Ron, you may remember the Cadillac Allard. I, I do. Okay. Uh, that beautiful car, beautiful car. But anyway, yours truly was pretty aggressive. But while we were putting on a display, it may have been a display for some people, but it was a race for me. <laughs> so, 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 so I managed, believe it or not, to catch up to the Cadillac Allard and to pass it in the corner at the, at, at the stock car track at the CNE. And that to me was that, that was it. I had the bug then. I really had the bug. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thought, geez, if I can do that with this car, I mean, it's, it's just a matter of time before I'm world champion. So uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we take it from there. So, but to answer your question, Sam, the, you know, the roar of the engines and the smell of the crowd has been pretty much the same sure. over the decades as to make it what's not, what's good about racing, what people like about it as competitors, what they like about it as organizers, what they like about it as drivers and mechanics and tuners and fabricators and welders. I mean, it's that, it's that passion that comes with exercising your skills and then seeing it on display in the hands of a professional. I mean, it's just, I mean, I mean, who can ever forget? Who can ever forget Ron Fellows down in the United States in a Cadillac making a pass on the last corner of the last lap to win the race in somewhere in California? You remember that, Ron? Long Beach. Uh, yeah, it was Long Beach. Yes. Long Beach. Yeah, I mean, it yeah, was mid I mean, it mid two thousands. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was. I mean, it was to me. It was uh, to me. That's one of the. That was one of the uh, Ron Fellows moments for me. Was just the desire to win, but not at any cost. But to take that car on the outside. Remember the. Your competitor there is driving his ass off, thinking he's got the best of you, and then all of a sudden you go around him on the left. That's a W. <laughs> that's a WTF moment for him. <laughs> <laughs> but but so yes. So Sam, all of that passion, all of sure. that passion is the same, and the the you know the night Ron we at Mosport we took the Corvette team over to the cart track and like you're the driver, they, they weren't any different in the carts than they were in the Corvettes on the cart track. No. I mean, boom, go. So, and he couldn't get enough. And but what was his name? Banks? Oh, uh, Binks, Danny Binks. Yeah. Binks, yeah. I mean, he's just right in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Nothing. But, yeah, Max Max Pappas. It was nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 so so I mean, I mean there it was, and 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 we had put on as you remember, Ron, uh, uh, some food. They were more interested in getting in the carts than they were eating the food. Well, we do oh, carts yeah. first, yeah. food later. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I actually so, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. So, so, so that's the passion that 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 I've known and lived with for many, many years. Sure. So, um, the the difference was. Um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that C CTMP was, uh, was the permanent built racing facility, and so you were going from these airport circuits to yes, something yes. that was a like Grand Prix level. Yes. Uh, track. So yes. I find that interesting, though. I guess I assume the the passion and the and the feeling and the ability doesn't doesn't necessarily change. But the when the circuit changes, I was just wondering if there was like you know a real a real change in the culture. But I mean, it there, makes was, sense there was a it. change. There was yeah. a change. I okay. can tell you what it is. Sure. When we, or at least I can take a shot at describing it a little bit. Sure. Um. On the airport circuits, as a driver, you could experiment uh, because if something didn't quite go right, <laughs> the, 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 the price you paid was not that high. You yeah. might lose a position, but you didn't lose a car. Yeah, there's a lot of runoff out there. So, I guess, so there right? was so much runoff and you could experiment as a driver and then find out what no, what, what, what your what the car's limits were and what your limits were and recover from it as as part of your learning thing so once you went from being a novice to i'll call a seasoned driver then it became the difference between whether you finished in the top five or the bottom five but <clears throat> What I learned, what I learned out of all of that was uh, because in some of those days I raced against Roger Penske at Harewood. Wow. He had his Porsche and I had my MGTC. Okay. <laughs> I mean, cut him some slack. I had to let him go once in a while. But anyway, um, <laughs> the, the, the thing was. What I learned at the end of the race, you go um, listen to what the winning drivers had to say, which is what I did. A lot of the people stayed in their own group. So if, you're, if, you, if you finished 20th, then you went and talked to the guys who finished 19th and 21st. I didn't do that. Right. I went because I wanted to hear what Roger Penske had to say about the race or Oliver Jean de Vienne or, or whoever it was. And that, I learned a lot from listening to their comments about how, what the race was like for them. So, hmm. and then, and then I said, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Okay. So, right. So that was kind of, that was kind of that now. Um, so the learning curve is when a lot of people, um, experienced a, a learning situation that was really, really good. Now, at CTMP, you learned very quickly the limits of the track were there. You had right. to respect those if you wanted to survive. And right. uh, so, so, yeah, that was one of the main differences. How did uh, how did Comstock get started, and how did, how were you involved in all of that? And I'm sure that's a heavily loaded question. <laughs> um, not really. Um, okay. <laughs> I first of all, oh, I have to be nice here. Um, <laughs> Comstock was run by a man who had enormous passion, who had disposable income from a corporate point of view, 
and great relationships with Ford Motor Company. Um, the team was made up of volunteers, uh, mechanics, et cetera, et cetera, who uh, tended to know a lot about repairing cars, but not a lot about race preparing them or actually racing them. And, you know, not much experience with tires and how to read them and blah, 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 uh, sure. suspension and how to tune it, blah, blah, blah. So um, the fact that Chuck Rathgeb sponsored the, um, what do you call it? Um, international bobsled team. Oh, okay. And had enormous success sponsoring that and won the world championship. Uh, made him want to have more of that feeling and that taste of competition and the taste of and a challenge of, of racing and, and victory. Hmm. So he invested a lot in Comstock racing team with Bill Sadler and that sort of thing. And, and then, um, got, uh, got a Cobra from Ford, did a deal with Ford, got a Cobra. Um, but they're not very successful. So at that point in time, I was, uh, I earned my living. I, I had gone from the advertising and sales promotion field to decide that I really wanted to be in the automotive side of things and in the racing thing. So I, I went and became a mechanic and right. uh, I worked with Epi at the dealers, the Roots dealership on, on Mount Pleasant Road. Cool. And um, so, but I also did some specialty work for Ford. So one day the phone rang and it was a chap from Ford who said, um, we, we'd like to make some improvements in the performance of our, of our investment in racing vehicles. And would, would, would you and Epi be interested in, 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 in looking after the Cobra? So um, we chatted about that and, said yes. So I made arrangements to go up to Comstock to look at that. And the people at Comstock were not very friendly to us. So, um, but, but Epi and I were a really, really good team. Epi was a man of few, few words, as you know. And um, I had learned from a business point of view when to be quiet and when to say something. And uh, so we we said, yeah, we'll uh, okay, we'll 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 look after that. So the first race we went to at C at Mosport, Comstock had taken the Cobra out of the truck and just parked it over here, and put a set of spare tires beside it and a jack and a wheel wrench kind of thing, and that was it. So the team said, well, there's your car, you go for it. So un, 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 undaunted, Epi and I said, okay, fine, that's the deal. So um, we started practicing. So there was Epi in the car and there was me in the pit. And, uh, uh, and the next thing you know, at the end of the weekend, we won the race, which is the first time the car had won. Nice. So Ford liked that. I bet. <laughs> and Chuck Rathgeb liked that. And wanted more of it. So that was the end of the year. So during the winter, I got a call from Ford saying, um, would you be willing to talk about becoming the team manager for Comstock Racing Team? And I knew the politics of the thing at the time was that Chuck is there as the corporate jock. Okay, he's he, he's the one that did did, did, that did the um, Olympic stuff. He's the one that did the ballooning championships. 
He's the one that did the rallying in Europe. He's the one that did the um, uh, airplane race from Vancouver to Toronto. Um, which, by the way, the team threw a rag into the engine in Winnipeg, and he never finished that one. But um, the um, so they they said, "Do you want to? You know, w w w would you would you take on that job?" So I said, "Okay." Um, so I took took the job. So the day I went up to Comstock, I drive up there thinking this is really neat. So I drive up there. The door's locked. So I go find a guy with a key, opens it up. I go inside Comstock, bunch of cars there, no people. They had all quit. They don't quit. So anyhow, um, Why? it's just they didn't want to work for me. Okay, so Nick, I, next I said, question. Same as the same as the last one. Why? Why? <laughs> Why would anyone not want to work for you, Paul? Because planning. Oh. Um, plan for what's doable. Don't plan for wishes. Uh, make sure you've got a plan that's achievable by and unto itself. Make sure you've got the budget to execute the plan. Make sure you've got an organization that knows how to spend the money, not waste it, and set reasonable results and do it on a progressive, continuous improvement basis until you get to where you need to be. So they didn't so, want to be a race team. Pardon me? <laughs> they didn't, that's like all the things that makes a race team. Yeah, well, exactly. So, <laughs> so we put that together. And the next thing you know, we had people coming, stepping forward, Say, can I be part of that? Okay, sure. So we got uh, we we got really good people that 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 were willing to sort of. I mean, I didn't profess to know everything about everything, but I just knew how to plan it from a business point of view. Right. I also knew how to drive. Okay. So anyhow, so we did that, and uh, everything fell into place, and uh, eventually, um, eventually, uh, we got to have an incredible amount of success yeah and people used to think it's because we had a bottomless pit of money no it's far from it um so it, it all worked out like anything else and ron you know from your experience with gm and corvette what you have to do to create a team and what you have to do to keep their interest and what you have to do to uh uh, to keep them employed. So mm -hmm. there used to be a thing that there used to be a thing that people said about Ford and that was race on Sunday, sell on Monday. You may recall that. Yeah. Well, actually you couldn't have been farther from the truth because the real idiom was win on Sunday, sell on Monday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody could race, but not everybody could win. Sure. So, uh, so, so, winning became what it was all about. You had to have the equipment. What what we found what we found in uh, at most for a lot of people came to the racetrack. They spent the first practice session finishing building the car. They spent the qualifying session practicing. And they got to the race and weren't sure what the hell they're doing. Well, when it was time that we, we prepared the cars before we left, we practiced at the time when we had to practice. We qualified at the time of qualifying and we raced at the time of racing. And the whole deal was don't hurt the car and don't hurt people. So, so I mean, there's all the sort of normal kinds of things. It, it's it very simple, be easy to talk about, easy to understand. And and when I needed money, I was simply, it was a lot easier to get more money if you were winning. Sure enough. Okay. So um, the, uh, there was, it, it, it was, they were really, really incredibly fun days, but there's a few things about that I'll, I'll, I'll bring 
to your attention. And and just to refresh the yeah. the years, the year the Comstock years were when to when? Sixty-three to sixty-eight. Okay. Sixty-nine. So we got Ford had quit, but Ford of Canada decided to carry on because they were getting they because the the Mustang was it. That Mustang was the it car. But see, but I also in the winter time went to various universities and gave presentations on Ford's approach to racing and thus Ford's approach to, uh, you know, I get, you know, the Mustang couldn't have won if it hadn't been a good car to start with. But um, one of the most intriguing things that I used to ask the, um, um, people at the university, I would, I, I would address the graduating class of engineering to be able to talk to them about the factory and be able to talk to them about this, mm -hmm. that, and the other thing. So one of the, at one of them, a real surprise question came to me at the University of Kingston, where someone at question period said, why did the early Mustangs only have a bench seat in the front? my answer was, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so the rest, the, the rest of the crowd in the theater, just, I mean, it was, it was fabulous. It was fabulous. They had to take sort of a little break while they explained to this guy what the deal was when you're that age. And, and so uh, it, it was just a really, really, we had a lot of fun teaching that and it was part of Ford's recruitment program as well. So, um, but being able to take a car where you're also the driver, you're also the team manager and be able to stand in front of a group of engineers and take on, take whatever question that they, that they had. And Ford was good because they sent me to, to, to Detroit, to learn how to give presentations and to learn how to deal with that sort of stuff. So, so I mean, they were Ford, Ford really knew what they were doing uh, along and, but Imperial Tobacco didn't, they, uh, they, uh, they, they just, they just did whatever was necessary. They, they were sort of, Ford was the, the racing arm of that union and, uh, and, and players was the, promotional arm of that so we had uh, we had we had a lot of fun um with that um can i ask what the what was the focus for com the comstock racing team like was it to win uh um, like the canadian sports car title or was it to compete uh, across the border or like what was the main focus at comstock we prepared about 63 cars during oh, the years. Wow. Okay. Oh. And, and um, I managed private privateers. Okay. So, so we would help. We did, we did uh, rallying on a domestic nature. We did rallying on a provincial nature. We did um, uh, amateur road racing um, and we did national road racing. And then, uh, with the advent of the GT40, we did international. So, so it was a structured approach to all of that. And each of those elements had to be managed. And what I would do would, would take a, a, a team from each province and help them with vehicles and help them with tuning and help them with driving so that they could go out and they could be the local heroes. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, it, and it worked. And uh, we had things, it wasn't all that easy sometimes because for example, we were entered in the Shell 4000 one year with a team of Anglias and they were, I used to spend a lot of time in England and that's another fabulous story of mine, but 
Uh, I went over to England to build the Anglias. Anyway, they came over in the boat, but they got held up at New York with a Teamster strike. And so I had to build three rally cars from nothing. We had to go and get the, the cars from the dealers and, and start, start, all, start with nothing but the shop floor and put a rally car together in, 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 in 10 days. Three of them. <laughs> we did that and, 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 and won. So, wow. <laughs> so, it, so there was a lot more to Comstock than, 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 than meets the eye. But um, there were a few things like out testing the Mustangs when we were doing that. And I had a chap by the name of Paul McLennan who would test with me. And I remember we were up in Uxbridge somewhere testing shock absorbers. Shock absorbers was a big problem with the Mustangs. And they would overheat and, 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 and then stop working, as, as you guys know. Uh, anyhow, we worked with uh, a company to help develop shock absorbers that worked. But anyway, we were traveling on a road and they had the humpback bridges uh, at the time. So here we are going full tilt down the gravel road, came to the humpback bridge. This is a winter time. And up over the bridge, so we're in, we're, we're in mid-flight, and there's a plow coming up the other side. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. So anyway, Paul McClendon, I got to tell you, calm as a, he just let it land. But while it was up in the air, he turned the wheel. And when it landed, it came it just darted off to the right, missed the plow. Now we went down into the ditch, but we came back out again and just carried on as if it had never happened. <laughs> oh my God. So, so, but, but, but you know, Ron and, 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 and you to a degree, Sam, if you're a race driver, expect the unexpected, expect the unexpected. And if you're going down the Mulsanne straight and you lose a tire, you better know what you're doing. You yeah, just, you're... and you, Ron, you had that happen to you. Uh, more I than once. Once. Yes. More than once. More than once. You yes. better, you better one, know what one, you're one, doing. One. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, the, yeah, the, the one time was on the rundown from, the uh, Mulsanne hairpin to Indianapolis, and it happened yeah. just where there's a bit of a kink in the brow and and a bit of elevation, and it mm -hmm. just I picked up a stone, and the tire just explode, right rear just exploded, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I went, I hit pretty hard in the guardrail, but we got we got the car back. I did manage to get the car back to the pits, and we got it fixed, um, but there was a and, and I remember running down to uh, on the Mulsanne to the first chicane, having a similar similar issue, but managed to manage to ma maintain some level of control. Just because we had had a little bit more asphalt, and we were generally going in a straight yeah. line. But yeah, no, it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a terrifying thing to have yes at, at that speed to have a, a major major. Uh, major failure like that, and yeah. and again, that's and that's uh, Le Mans unique in that way where you've got on these public roads, you don't know what kind of debris is out there. Yeah, they do their best to clean it, but the uh, you know in a twenty four hour race, uh, people going off and dragging gravel back onto the track. Yes. That's yes. yeah. That was that was probably the single biggest problem that in the the years that I did Le Mans where you. You'd go through a chicane, and you just and you, but there'd be somebody just gone through the gravel, and you think, "Oh, don't cut a tire! Don't cut a tire! Don't cut yeah, a yeah, tire!" Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, how easy was it to overdrive your headlights? Uh, overdrive the headlights? Yeah, um, I, I would say, yeah. To, to put that in context, the the um, you know the 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 aiming of of headlights is, was super critical because you're 
you know, unlike on a, on the road where you're, you know, that is it's based on a particular speed. When you're going yeah, yeah, three yeah, times yeah. three times the speed limit, you need, you know, much much like you behind the wheel, you've got to yeah. eyes up. Yeah, same with the lights. You know, yeah. the lights have to be. They've got to get. Uh, they've got to be more powerful, and and also reach. Um, you know, get uh, um, get farther down the road because you're you're traveling at such a higher rate of speed. And then there's also it also have lights angled to be able to see apexes. So, yeah. but it was it was you know the relatively easy. I, I would say not to not to overdrive, but it, it was easy to get behind when uh-huh. yeah you know ba- because of the you know, you, you're, you're, you're operating from some level of muscle memory, but, you know, particularly in the high speed sections, um, you know, it was easy to be a little bit late just based on positioning the lights. Cause you're, you're, as you're, as you're approaching a corner, you, you know, your eyes are in particular something high speed. You want to be, you want to be super accurate at turning at high speed Yes. early, early as opposed to late. And it was, that was a common, common thing to, to, is, you know, to be, to look, to be looking in extra early and have uh, extraordinary vision um, because uh, the, the lighting was only, only so good. Yes. So. Yes. Well, you know, I, I hope people watching this podcast uh, maybe can appreciate that when you're a professional race driver, such as yourself, Ron, when you were called, you get the call to go to a place like the high speed track, you have to bring with you an enormous amount of experience and talent and skills and be prepared for what I used to call the OS factor. First word, oh, second word, you figure it out. Um, <laughs> yes. you, you, I mean, you, you better, you, you better, you better know how to control your your yes. OS factor when it happens. Oh, oh, oh doo doo, yes. yes. Yeah, oh, doo doo, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, which which leads me, and we can come back to some other questions, but I'll I'll give you a little funny one. Um, when we were doing the, uh, mo- the, 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 the Mustang, and I, I built the Mustang at Comstock to be the sister car to the GT50, GT350. Um, that car that I was building was going to be featured at the Canadian National Exhibition for stand and then it was going to be tested and then it would go to Montremblant where I, and I was driving the car as well as building it and then we'd come back the next week and, and then run at uh, at CTM at, at Mosport. So when uh, we took the we took the, the car out of the exhibition, during halfway through, and you know how difficult that can be, we got it out and we had to took it up to the shop and put the right tires on it, blah, 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 and put it back in the trailer and went out to Mosport, which is the first time the car would have turned a wheel. Anyway, I go out and do about 10 laps or so just getting the feel for the car, uh, getting a feel for the tires and the brakes and the kinds of things you do when you're, you're, you're waiting for that OS moment based on just having taken the car off the stands at the shop and now you're testing it. So then after, so I come back in and we make a few little adjustments with the toe and tire pressures, et cetera, et cetera, and adjust the shot. So I go out, I go back out, so I do one lap, a fairly good clip, and then decide to, well, let's, let's put the hammer down and see where we go here. So I'm going up the back straight. And then all of a sudden, everything went black. I had no idea where I was. 
and I used my memory and dead reckoning because it had come up over the top of the hill, if you recall, in those days when the hill was there. And you're going down into eight. I managed to get the thing. I immediately hammered, the, put the steering wheel straight, hammered the brakes, and I'm waiting for it and waiting for it and waiting for it. And then it starts to slide. And the next thing you know, it stops. And I'm about a foot away from the barrier. What happened was, in the haste of the moment, when the car was on display at the CNE, it was on an elevated stand about four or five feet up. You could see inside the car. So I had left the headliner in so it looked good. Well, guess what turned everything black at, at, at Bosport? The headliner came down on top of me. Oh my god! And it was like like I could see nothing, and I I couldn't take my hands <laughs> off the steering wheel. I and and anyway, it was it was you talk about you talk about an OS moment. But um, yeah, that's anyway. I uh, I got out of the car. <laughs> Figure out where the hell I am. I thought, okay, this looks okay. So managed to pull the headliner up and go back and to the pit to say, you know, we forgot to do something. So and then we just we just, we, we just we didn't lament it too too much. We said, well, let's just just get on with our test. So uh, we did the test. Uh, the next day went to uh, went to Trombla won that race, came back to most sport, won that race and carried on. But those are sort of interesting moments in the development <laughs> of a car. So you gotta be, you gotta, you gotta be really, really careful. Um, Don't forget to take out the headliner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, um, uh, that's funny. Um, there's a kind of another interesting one. Um, We're at, uh, we're developing stuff with the break, Kelsey Hayes. And, and oh, yeah. when, 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 uh, when you were a, a, a team manager for, for a Ford team, you, you had to play a role in helping develop certain parts of the car. And then you get together and, you know, and I was just great guy. Okay. So anyhow, the engineer, we're going to, we're going to Trombla. The engineer came to um, Trombla. And when we're at Trombla, he said to me on Friday night, I came up in my airplane. Uh, hey, do you want to go for a ride with me? So I don't, Ron, do you remember Gray Rocks? Uh, Gray Rocks vague, Lodge, vague, Lodge. Yeah, vague, vaguely, yes. I recall the, I recall the yeah, name of the place. Well, yeah. well, that was the big place then those days. Yeah. And right down the street from that was uh, the airport, a grass yeah. grass runway. So I said, okay, we'll go. So um, we went down, got in, they got into the plane, and we're rumbling, going down the, the grass, to uh, uh, take off. And um, we get up and we're flying around and we go down a, a box canyon. The reason we went down the box canyon is as we were, as we buzzed the racetrack, we saw the Quebec Provincial Police helicopter take off and start to chase us. Oh, okay. God. <laughs> so here we are. Going up this, he turns and goes down a blind canyon. A blind canyon, so we couldn't go up, and so we had to go down and do a do a U turn and come back. And we met the helicopter still going down that other way. So uh, anyway, so he comes a after he does this bank and, and, and turns around. We're 
he's all of a sudden there are bells and whistles and sirens start to go off in the aircraft and he reaches over and he's got a control and he's saying, come on, baby, come on, baby, come on, baby. And I'm sitting there saying, <laughs> oh my God. So anyway, he scared the you know what out of me, but anyway, the, and then I, then I see the helicopter, I see, not the, I see the, the propeller going, yippity, 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 yippity. And then brrrm, it all starts in a big cloud of smoke as we're going down. So we get back to the airport and land. The, the, the Quebec helicopter was going poor in sight. We go back and he parks under trees. And then a little while, about three or four minutes later, we see the helicopter come by and they're not there. Now, fast forward. You can imagine how I felt in that aircraft. Basically, I don't like really, really don't like airplanes. So anyway, he came to the fall event at Mosport, and we're at Kennedy Roads. And when I was at, we had four GT40s at Comstock. Wow. Um, one of them was mine, which I used as a road car. So anyway, <laughs> um, I said, do you want to go out to Mosport with me? He said, "Yeah," and I said, well, "I'm going to take the I'm going to take the the, the GT40. Oh, really good." So, anyway, now uh, help help me here, guys. When you go out, you go up. What's the street you go up? Liberty, Liberty Street. And yeah, Liberty. The, yeah, that's yeah. Liberty Street goes into Bowlingville. Yeah. Right yeah, there. yeah. And as you're heading up towards Bowsport, it does all the Dipsy Doodles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When there's an intersection just before that. So we're sitting there, and I said, Bill, I said, do you remember we were in trouble? And you took me <laughs> on a, an airplane ride? He said, yeah. And I looked at him, and I said, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, my re, this is my return OS moment for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you remember... There's going up Liberty Street. It, it turns on to another road. You go, you go uphill and then you go downhill on a yeah. right hander. Well, just before then, there's a really whoop de doo. So I, I went fast enough to get the GT40 off the road. So we're mm -hmm. kind of flying. Okay. So we come back down and then we head down that hill and we get down. So I just got ball brakes on and all that sort of stuff. And so we get to we get to most for we get into the we get into the paddock and I get out of the car. He didn't get out and I said, oh, come on, he said, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> so it was payback time, but you know, those are sign of, those, those are moments that are that, that that are really, really interesting. One that's is this going on too long, guys, or what? No, we're no. good. We're good. Okay. Yeah, no, we want to. We I want to hear. I want to hear about the uh, carry on, but I want to hear about the uh, moving when you were working on Can Am cars and then the Formula One car with uh, with Epi. Yeah, and, yeah uh, I'd like anyway, to hear about that as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, but I'll, I'll tell you one about the Formula One race. Sure. Uh, Sixty-seven, I think it was. Um, we had. I, I was concerned about the safety at Formula One race, and I'm the clerk of the course or race director, with whatever you want to call it. So I said to Harvey, we need more equipment here, and I, we need a Jaws of Life. And he said, we can't afford anything like that. And I said, and they were pretty expensive at the time. So I said, well, I have a friend in Indianapolis and I think I could convince him to bring his team and, and, and his equipment. And he said, well, how much is it going to cost? And I said, Harvey, if you, if, if, if you ask that question and expect me to answer it, then you better find someone else to look after your event because that's not the point. It is what it is. So I was unreasonable. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> I, I I get hold of my friends in Indianapolis, and they're the four 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 man team was ready to come. 
uh, they rent a they rent a van. They put all their equipment in it, and they they head for the most part on the Thursday night. They hit Detroit and a big rainstorm, and they get rear-ended and push their vehicle into the vehicle in front of them, resulting in really bad damage and um, a really broken arm to, to, to one of the team members. So anyway, they, they called me. So they said, uh, no, we're coming. So anyway, then make a long story short, they can't leave until the next one, which is Friday. Friday afternoon, practice. Ian Ashley and the Hesketh, you remember? Yeah. Yeah. They used to they used to call him Ian Crashley. He goes up the back street and becomes airborne and goes off and drivers left and hits the um, TV tower about midships. So. Mm -hmm. His, the, 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 the Hesketh and, and, and the tower come down onto the, onto the grass. So it took about 40 minutes to get him up. And um, remember the Hesketh was a two frame car at the time. So it was, as, and, and so was the tower for the TV it was two frame. Yeah. So we had all these tubes all mixed up. But, Took a while to, so the anyway anyway so so there's a there's a get my back straight here. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the paddock about this, and Jochen Moss is a troublemaker, and he was with McLaren, and James Hunt was on the team, and so this Moss, is this is seventy six. Whatever He's, year that was, yeah. Yeah, I think it might, may have, must have been 76, yeah. Okay, so anyhow, um, Moss, had, uh, sorry, York and Moss had got sideways after one, hit the guardrail on right hand, driver's right, between one and two, and the guardrail did that, right? Was Hunt Which, with Hesketh, or was he with McLaren? Yeah, it was, no, was with McLaren. It was McLaren. Yeah. Oh, okay, so yeah, 76. So anyhow, um, sorry, the guardrail did what it was supposed to do. Anyhow, it got to be a problem because Moss, uh, the, 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 the guardrail saved his car. It also saved him, okay? Anyhow, um, we got all that looked after, but Sunday morning, um, I get a call from Bernie Ecclestone. He said, uh -huh. uh, come and see me. So I went to see him and he, he told me that uh, Hunt had come to him and they were circulating among the drivers and they're going to boycott the race. So they're not going to race. So Ecclestone and I talked about it and he said, here's what we're going to do. Uh, he said, get a car, put it on the start, put, put it on the start, finish straight. I'm going to bring some drivers over. We're going to get in the car. He says, Hunt's problem is, he said, none of the people around the racetrack have any experience. So um, he said, we need to fix, we need, we need to do something about that. So I said, okay. So he said, uh, okay, you're going to drive the car, Paul. Hunt will be beside you. I will be behind you. Moss will be beside me and Mario Andretti will be beside him. He said, I want you to keep your cool. Um, we're going to go to each corner and we're going to talk to the Martians. He said, if I want you to really hammer hunt, 
I'll give you a jab in the ribs from behind. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I had I had race control bring all the corner seniors out to the edge of the racetrack. So I drive down to, um, and I said, we're going to talk about your experience. So I, I drive down to turn one, introduce the, and I knew all the marshals. I introduced them to Mr. Hunt and I said, okay, uh, Mr. Hunt, you can ask whatever questions you want. In the meantime, Bill will explain to you who he is. Anyway, we did all that. Okay. There was not much to, left to be desired, but good people. So we do the same thing at two driver's right. Okay. Then we do the same thing at three driver's right. And Hunt says, I've had enough. And I said, oh, what does that mean? He said, well, we don't need to do this anymore. And I said, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Hunt, I think we do. We're going to continue around this racetrack and we're going to finish what we came out here to do. So we went to every corner post and ended up back at the start finish. Got out of the car, stood around and talked and then it dissipated. You can imagine what was going on amongst everybody around the racetrack. But what we said before we left is we're not going to say anything to anybody. All we were doing was having a look at the racetrack. That's all we were doing. And that's it. So I, 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 I give them credit. They, they held to that. Okay. But you can imagine all what everybody was thinking while we were doing all of that. <laughs> so anyway, the comeuppance of the thing was during the race, Mr. Hunt did a no-no, including punching a marshal. Ah, uh, this is so. This is seventy-seven then. Oh well, what? Uh, yes, nineteen seventy-seven. Sorry. At which point in time, and he also crossed the racetrack in traffic. At which point in time, I made a report to the stewards and asked that, 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 that the two infractions be dealt with. So he got a $3,500 fine, which was a substantial amount in those days. But, 100%, yeah. I, but I, I didn't get a Christmas card from him that year. <laughs> so, so, but anyway that was kind of an interesting story it's a behind the scenes right story okay so yeah. uh you, you never get you didn't get a jab in the ribs from bernie uh yes i got a couple from him at this point in time i i, 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 I as we were leaving the turn one i got a jab so when we got to turn two we're talking, uh, uh, I stopped the car just before the marshal had turned two, and I said, Mr. Hunt, I'm not sure how much you know about this kind of stuff, but based on our last stop, I don't think you know a heck of a lot. So, you know, <laughs> if, if you could be, if you could be a little more polite to our marshals, it would be very much appreciated. Okay. And so, he was, so he was skeptical that the marshals were experienced enough. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, it was a defining moment, frankly. But anyhow, and you guys, you know, you guys know eventually what what transpired with the race, but but that was kind of a uh, that was kind of an interesting anecdote for an event like that. So yeah. um, um, another interesting one was uh, when the USAC race came to most work. Okay. Uh, I got a call saying um, Mario Andretti and Billy Foster are racing this event. And we got a call from Mario saying 
who knows the most about this racetrack that we can talk to? So we gave them your name, Paul. So Mario and Billy Foster came to Comstock Race Team and we talked about the racetrack and the racetrack was famous for turn two, which and they had all this thing in their mind about adverse cambers and going off the road and all of that. So anyhow, why am I telling you this? Because here's Paul Cook at Comstock Racing Team with Mario Andretti and Billy Foster coming to me, asking me to take them out to Bosport and to help them learn the track. Well, what a, I have to tell you, that was such a treat. It really, I know the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. Wow. And when we got out there and uh, I had the, I had the station wagon from Comstock. Not, it was not your average station wagon. Let me put it in that one. <laughs> and, and, and anyway, I, I gave it to them. I gave it to them to do what you want with it. Okay. So they, I sat in the pit while, meow, meow, meow. Okay. I mean, it was very quiet, but nevertheless, then it scared me because it went, meow. And then I never heard anything for 10 minutes. <laughs> but they stopped off and somewhere off in the track. Oh, okay. But uh, anyhow, they, uh, nicest people. And we had dinner that night, but we're somewhere in where we stay, Flying Dutchman or something. But anyhow, that was an interesting moment. Um, when did you there? guys? When did you guys race? Uh, what? What's? What was the involvement with Comstock and Can Am? Nothing really. Oh, okay. Other, uh, uh, other than. Other than we raced the GT40 every chance we, we got, which was, um, right. do you remember the USRRC series run? Yep. Sports car series. That was at, that was at most sport. Um, Bruce McLaren and I were friends and when he raced in North America, he headquartered at Comstock. Hmm. Oh, cool. And um, we, they, they, they brought the, they brought the team of cars there. And um, one of the things I did for them was in the fall, they would send one of the can -M cars up to the shop and I would equivalize the car for them and do all the right North American nut and bolt sizes and uh, all of the hydraulic hoses and all that. And I would, I would give them an equivalency for AN stuff. And um, I also did that for Ferrari uh, to help them convert their Formula One car to AN. And after I did it for Ferrari, amazingly enough, one day, Great big huge box got delivered to me at Comstock. A great big huge thing, with every with every Ferrari memento you could ever imagine inside it. So so they just you know this sort of thing was filled with filled with memories. But with Bruce, one of the things that um, happened was when he sent his first Formula One car over to Canada. I have. Uh, a picture of the car on the cover of Autosport magazine. And on that picture, you see the shipping memo taped to the front of the car. I also have that shipping memo in my collection. Oh. Okay. Now, unfortunately, the car got loose in the airplane uh -oh. and started 
Um, anyway, I went out to collect the card. And when, when I collected the car, I looked at it and said, this car's a lot shorter than it should be. And, and, <laughs> and so, but fortunately, someone had taken the nose and stuffed it in the seat. Huh. But, but every, like the whole subframe from the front all the way to the front bulkhead, gone. Wow. So I got, and, and I mean, there was sort of tubes everywhere and, and hydraulic cylinders, which the cylinders were hung on the front of the bulkhead run, uh, which was normal. So anyway, I called my friend, said, Lucas, and they were the curling distributor, and they came up immediately and looked at all the fragments and got me the cylinders. They were standard cylinders, by the way. Uh, they, they, they went and got all that stuff for me. I got the Comstock fabrication people to come and we tried to put together the um, frame of the, of, of the front and they were able to emulate that and build a new, build a new frame that bolted onto the bulkhead. So by the time Bruce and I called Bruce and told him what happened, he said, I can't send anybody over. He said, they're all in bed. They work seven days a week. They're all in bed, Paul. There's nothing I can, he said, anything you can do, I would absolutely appreciate it. So anyway, by the time they got here, the car was done. Okay. Oh. And, 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 and everything fitted. Now, the event was that and I helped them with the car. Uh, we're going to win the race. The car pulls off on the side of the road, dead in a doornail. And so at the end of the race, we bring it back. The battery was dead because number one mechanic for Bruce forgot. We, 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 do, do you remember the little gel cell batteries, the, the, the white ones? We had one ready to go after practice to put it in for the race. He never changed the battery. And so uh, otherwise Bruce could have won, could have won that race. And then wow. so so it was kind of an interesting story, but but there's 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 just all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. Um <laughs> Norris McDonald told a story about Harvey and putting money in garbage bags. <laughs> I forget which event it was, but it was a fall event. I was the clerk of the course and I had a I had a, a course car that I used, which was a Porsche. On Sunday before the start of the race, we got a call from the senior at 5A drivers left. But there was something wrong down there. And all of a sudden, and this happened all the time, there was a branch of a tree was getting in the way. Of course, it obviously had gotten away for the earlier part of the week. But anyway, you have to, the nervousness of the marshals before the start of the race often surfaced some stuff. Okay. So anyway, I went down to see what the problem was. And, um, and and that was pretty simple. I said, well, if you lean forward, like you always do, the branch isn't in your way. Well, oh, yeah. Anyway, while I'm doing that, he says, oh, by the way, someone's getting in your car. So I turn around and look, and sure enough, here goes the car up the back street. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> so I get on the radio right away. And I tell race control to uh, that someone's taken the car and to uh, close the exit of the track at turn 10 drivers left and to the paddock at drivers right. So anyway, Harvey had already been, he was, Harvey listened to all the radios, sat in his office. Remember Harvey's wife would sit there? She was knitting all the time. Do you remember that? Yeah, she was no. sitting. Yeah, she would sit there. She would knit all the time. 
And she made oh. stuff for the grandkids and all that thing. And she was nice. I forgot her name, but beautiful woman. And anyway, Harvey listened to all of the radios. He had them all on the, sh on the window. And uh, anyway, he had called the uh, Durham police. And the Durham police had a spotter up in the up in the, uh, the the timing stand, okay, and that policeman just followed the guy when he got out of the car, and followed him down through the into into the infield with a plain clothesman right behind him. Okay, so they 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 finally caught the guy, but the comeuppance was all the receipts for Sunday were in the trunk of the Porsche. So Harvey figured that was the safest place you run on the racetrack that you could have it. <laughs> and, 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 and it was just absolutely amazing because the, the, uh, the, money, the money truck would come to the tunnel at turn two drivers left. And that's where they make their exchanges. But Anyway, that was an interesting one where where all the money was in the Porsche. So, uh, <laughs> now the um, other interesting. But the guy, but the guy that, but the guy that, but the guy that stole it, stole it. Oh, they, they arrested. Rescued. They arrested. But he him. did. But he he didn't know it was what was in the trunk. He just wanted to drive the car. He, he just wanted to drive the car. <laughs> he was drunk. Okay, he was drunk. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and when he when he when he's uh he's going he he was going through the paddock apparently he didn't know where he was going he was just wandering okay but um, <laughs> anyway I think it was one of the last Formula One races where on Sunday night we had a, a dinner for all the Formula One people. And we did it at Tyrone in the Ladies Auxiliary Building in, in the Community Building Center. Oh, wow. And, and the ladies did this roast beef dinner, complete with mashed potatoes, gravy, buns, and the inevitable bun fight started with Chapman. <laughs> okay. And my God, there were buns flying everywhere. Okay. <laughs> Much to the chagrin of the ladies auxiliary who wondered. <laughs> um, and, I, and, and I, I couldn't do anything. It was not mine. It was not mine position to say anything but <laughs> I do remember one of the ladies saying I think we're going to run out of buns <laughs> <laughs> so so that's that 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 that's the you know those are some of the stories of right of, of my career in racing which by and large, centered around most sport for most of my adult life, and uh, for which I've been very proud uh, to be part of it. To be honest right. with you, and um, cool. and so, did you have some other questions, Sam? No, I think well, like we covered a lot of like some of the stuff that uh, I was wondering pretty early on. But yeah, it's been great hearing your your stories and everything. But I guess the um, the other question was, I think it was like the seventy, and I think Epi told us a bit of it in yeah, twenty seventeen. But the seven twenty seventeen, yeah. But the uh, the seventy four Grand Prix when you um when you guys got a a brabham for oh happy yeah um because yeah, it should, that have, was, should have been a pretty good car right but it, uh, turned out, no. it was <laughs> such a wonderful car that was 
Uh, <laughs> Bernie's, Bernie's uh, rent it here, leave it there car. Um, he just kept that. He made more money from that car than you could shake a stick at. Yeah. Because the car was, uh, it was one of those OS moments. And when, when you saw it, so when we got the car, when I brought it back to uh, Epi's shop in Thornhill, and um, so I'm up there, I took a, I t- I took a week or 10 days off because I was back in the corporate world in those days. But I took time off and I found some sponsorship money for it from my employer, et cetera, et cetera. And anyway, so I'm up there and I put the jack underneath the back to jack it up. So the car is sitting here and I got the jack underneath here. So I'm jacking it up and the car is going like this. <laughs> that's, that's the way it's jacking it up. Oh God. <laughs> and I looked at that and I thought, well, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> so Good anyway, I, 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 I put I put it back down and went and got some stands and we got we got the car up. The whole rear bulkhead was cracked all the way around. So uh, we had to take it all apart and uh, repair the bulkhead. Right. And put it put it back together. So by the time we got that done, we were right back where we started because who would expect that you're gonna to have to do that? But Bernie Bernie knew how to do it. He knew he knew that every time he rented that car, he would just send it to people the way he received it from the last people he rented it to. So the new people would do all the repairs for him. Yeah. I mean, he had it made. He had it made. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, we went yeah. out to, we got it done, went out to Mosport to test it. And we hadn't gone three laps and the engine decided it, the, the, the rods wanted a divorce from the block. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and got it. It, it just came apart, so I called Bernie immediately. They sent another engine over, and 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 uh, the result of that car was that uh, um, second, it had a ZF gearbox in it. And I knew a lot about ZF gearboxes, okay, because that's what we had in the GT40. Right. So I when I took I took the gearbox apart and very, they're very complicated gearboxes to set up, but I still remembered enough about it, and I still had some of the tools. So I took it apart. Second gear was a joke, and 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 so when we were running the car, we didn't think that you could you couldn't run most part without second gear. Sure. So Epi Epi tried Epi tried to, to to do the track in third gear, but it wouldn't work. But anyway, he, he just had to put it in second at five. Okay, or 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 or, 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 or the, the engine would balk. Okay, yeah. And anyway, second gear broke, and that was that. Yeah. But uh, now, oh, you got time for one more? Yeah, sure. Okay. Do you remember the Lotus 30? No. No. The Lotus 30 was a sports car. And it had what, a, what year? What year is this? Oh. Sixty sixty eight. Okay. Anyway. Ish. ish. Any, anyway, um, Chapman's team came to Homestock, and that's where they did all their stuff. So anyway, they had the uh, car at Mosport testing it. It couldn't go, it couldn't go three laps without boiling over. So. Anyhow, they brought it back 
and uh, to the shop and 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 Chapman is standing there with a mechanic by the name of Bob Dance, who was their chief mechanic, a guy that I knew from Cortina days, and and uh, we were we were friends. And uh, anyway, Chapman's there, and they're trying to figure out what to do. And and Jimmy Clark was there. They're trying to figure out what to do with this engine. So I said, uh, um. We we, 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 we we use these engines from Shelby. We use the Shelby engines. And we, we, we know quite a bit about it. And so maybe you might be able to help. And he looks at me and he says, he said, Paul, he said, we're not dummies. We run a very successful racing enterprise. And uh, <laughs> our, en our engineers, our engineers know what they're doing. And so I looked him in the eye and I said, well, if that's the case, Mr. Chapman, why can't the car run more than three laps? <laughs> Sizzle. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, see, nobody went up against Chapman. Yeah. But anyway, so uh, I said, I, I said there are some peculiarities about the engine that are relatively easy to fix. And uh, I said, I can take a look at it if you want. And he said, uh, well, no, we'll look after it. And Jimmy Clark said, uh, Colin, I'd like Paul to have a look at it if you don't mind. And Bob Dance said, yes. So Chapman said, well, do what the hell you want and stormed out of the building and went back to the hotel. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we took the, we took the, I, I, I took, got the heads off the engine. And one of the problems was there was too much water flow and um, you had to take the passages of the block. You had to drill them out. You had to tap them and you had to put plugs in to stop the water flow. And then you had to use the right head gasket, which they did not have, okay? But I had head gaskets. Then you had to take the water pump off and you had to cut every second blade off the water pump just, just to slow down the circulation, okay? Because that's what was creating a problem. And it couldn't get rid of, you know, the hot gases were going into the engine and and, and there's just too much flow. So um, anyhow, we got all that done and uh, then I said, uh, um, you've got the ZF box here. I said, what are you doing about second gear? And uh, Jimmy, who's Jimmy, who stayed there while we were doing all this, says, well, what do you mean? And I says, you, 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 you can't run this car with the second gear. I, you likely have. So we took the, I took the gearbox and looked at it, and I said, you haven't got a chance. So anyhow, um, on Sunday, he's second on the grid. There's one, two, three, four. He's over here, okay? And when the green standing start, when the green flag dropped, so did his transmission. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, splat! <laughs> the, the, the box split in half. All the gears and all the oil were all, all, all over the racetrack. <laughs> anyhow, anyhow, by the time, I, I can tell you, by the time the, the marshal did a good job, by the because they came from the pit across and they cleaned it all up. Mm -hmm. uh, before the cars came around, and and and, and so anyhow, so um, then then they were headed off to Riverside, and so Bob Dance came to me and he said, C -C -C "Colin has asked if you could come with us to uh, Riverside," <laughs> and I said, "No, th thanks, but no thanks. I, I can't go." So anyway, so that's another anecdote about. Uh, about what's going on, but um, anyhow, um, there's many, many other stories, but it would consume. Uh, someone said, you know, someone needs to write a book 
And yeah. I said, you know, you, you can't, you can't write this stuff. Yeah. You can talk about it as we are now. You can communicate it. You can ask questions. You can put some color into it. You can, you can emphasize things hard to write, hard to write that sort of stuff. But anyhow, um, so there's, uh, um, the only other, the only other thing, just in closing, Effie and I were off road. We, we were motocross guys. Okay. Yeah. So I had, I had my bike, he had his. So one day at, at most work, we, 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 we had taken the bikes with us, which is always, in, which is really a no, no. Um, anyway, so we got the, we got the bikes out and we went trundling around the infield up over south of turn eight. You're on the top of the hill and then you, you, you look down, right? Like that. So Abby and I are sitting on top of this thing, looking down and he said, are you ready? And I said, no. And he said, what's the matter? And I said, I'm not going down there. <laughs> and that's, I said, that's the highway to hell. So I'm not going down there. So he said, ah, oh, you chicken. So anyway, he goes down, gets near the bottom, promptly goes ass over tea kettle. A bike comes down on top of him. Oof. Oh. So uh, amazingly enough, I went down. I, I had no problem. I just, I just, I just locked up the rear wheel, just slithered all the way down, and, and I got off the bike, and the shifter peg had gone through the the calf of his leg. Okay. Oh. So I managed to pull that out. But anyway, um, I went back and, and I said, I'll go back and, 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 and get the car. And he said, no. So anyway, I made, he rode the bike back to the, to the paddock area. But then, uh, so I get, went and got him fixed up and Anyway, Walt McKay drove the car, the GT40, that weekend. And, uh, mm. But that, but it, but there's sort of a uh, that that most part such an exciting place. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so, do you guys have any questions or? No, I think like it's yeah. all about gathering like the stories, and mm -hmm. so we've got we've got lots of those <laughs> today. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Yeah. Okay, now, I insist that we set the record straight about the first event. At okay. <laughs> we, we will do that. Uh, that's important to me. And um, remember, Ron, that Carlo bought my share from me. Yes, he did. For $3,984.27. <laughs> okay. Uh, which is the value of that share after 150 years or whatever it was. But um, <laughs> anyway, but the check was made out to the Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital. Okay. So, that I recall. so, that, yes. so you recall that. So that yep. was, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I'm very proud to know you guys. And, um, um, it's interesting to, to, to see Sam, um, but I remember him being in a baby carriage. Um, you know, you're getting old. Okay. When, when, yeah. when, <laughs> but anyway, thank you for giving me the thank opportunity you. to represent no, thank you for one you. of the no, geriatrics. Okay. Yeah, no, 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 there's, there's, uh, you know, you've got, you've got a tremendous history in the sport. You have, given a tremendous amount and um yeah just a, a wealth of information and uh probably probably not 100 percent appreciated but um just you know the the uh, the work you've done thank you okay thank you guys and uh i look forward to future podcasts because they are really really interesting to hear people's cool. perspectives anyway have awesome. a good day take care thanks Paul. thank you all right take care thank, thank you thank you so much Bye -bye. paul thank you
Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.